welcome everybody. We truly appreciate taking time out of your day to tune in for another one of what I feel is one of our spectacular webinars. I think today's webinar is going to answer a lot of questions. And I know that um, you know our number one goal is to make sure we meet your expectations. And hopefully we are, especially during these times of volatility as we try to communicate with you as often as we can. And hopefully our communication has put some of your minds to ease. I know that the stock markets have made one heck of a turnaround since the middle of June, where the S&P is up about 16, 17% from the low point. NASDAQ is up about 22, 23%. And bonds have crawled back a little bit. Last week, we shared with you how we eased back into bonds. But without any further ado, let's talk about today's webinar, because I think today's webinar is going to give you a lot of great information. And the title of today's webinar is Personal Finance Strategies to Manage a High Inflationary Environment, which is exactly where we're at today. And on the presentation today, we have Harmony Wagner and Ryan Boucher. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand off the presentation and let me just kind of set the table for you. Today, we'll, we will go over investing in equities. Should you delay taking Social Security, taking a quick look of, at your household budget, avoid early payoff of low interest debt, and maybe purchase a leased car. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand off the presentation to Ryan, who will kick it off. All right, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I had to uh, unmute myself just to uh, make sure there wasn't any background noise before I came aboard. So, well, again, welcome and, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, investing in equities, that was you know the first piece of, of this presentation in terms of dealing with this high inflationary environment. And when you think about investing in equities, it's a lot easier said than done. I think, if, especially as we look back over the last you know, six to nine months. So I want to kind of look at, to kind of set the stage um, in this next slide, if we look on the right-hand side, this chart. So what this is showing goes back about three years. In, in purple, you see the U.S. Index of Consumer Sentiment, and in orange is the U.S. Inflation Rate. And really, you know, that first part of that graph for the U.S. Consumer Sentiment, you see it on the rise before it dramatically drops at the onset of COVID in early 2020. And why this feels so interesting and why you know, it relates to this sentiment of easier said than done with U.S. equities is that U.S. consumer sentiment really can be viewed as a leading indicator of economic conditions and in turn, maybe the stock market. And so when you see you know, COVID the precipitous drop that we saw kind of midway through 2020. And then we saw the sentiment starting to rise, not dramatically, but doing pretty well in early 2021, right about the same time as we saw in that orange graph, uh, inflation rates start to rise over 2%, start to go up. We saw consumer sentiment fall again. And what's really stunning about this graph to me personally, and as, as I've been talking about it over the last year, is the fact that it didn't take that long for that consumer sentiment to drop below even where it was during the worst times of COVID. And, you know, in COVID, we're dealing with a global pandemic, uh, stores, restaurants, travel, everything being shut down. We really didn't know what was next. And as bad as that got, inflation rate of, you know, 5% actually led U.S. consumers to be, feel like they were worse off than we were in COVID. And that's just really fascinating to me. And, you know, as a leading indicator, that just shows you that, you know, individuals are hesitant about what inflation will do to them, how it affects the economy, how it affects them personally and their spending power, whether it's for, you know, at the gas pump, at the grocery store. And so when you look at that, you can see why equity struggled so much as we entered the beginning of this year. High inflation scares consumers. And if they're scaring consumers, if people are scared to shop, obviously that's going to bring on a pessimistic view of the stock market. But 
you know, when we look back over time and consider investing in equities during periods of high inflation, you know, if you think about it, over the last 100 years plus or so, the S&P 500 has averaged about a 10% annualized return. Pretty good given, you know, where we are at from an inflation standpoint. The median real rate of return over a two-year time frame following periods of high inflation is about 18.5%. Again, you know, a good place to be during, during these times. Uh, as we've seen, you know, so far this year, especially, we've seen it firsthand, bonds are negatively impacted by high inflation. One of the big reasons being, you know, that real value of future income payments decreases. The other reason being, and we've seen it, what the Fed is doing, right? The Fed has a dual mandate, keep inflation in check and keep uh, unemployment rates low. And so as, uh, you know, inflation is high as we've seen it, they have to raise interest rates. That's going to be a negative to uh, fixed income and the value of bonds. And then, you know, lastly, cash loses its value. And it happens slowly and silently as inflation starts eating away at purchasing power. And I know for many, many folks, it, it feels, you know, it, when you go back over the last six, seven months, it feels so much safer to hold cash. But, you know, even though it's per, it for some time performed better than bonds, it performed better than stocks, for quite some time. The hardest part about holding cash is when do you put it back into the markets? And that's where people really struggle with cash. And, and sometimes you find yourselves, you know, two, three years later, as the market, you know, look at some of these stats that the market's up 18, 20%, still struggling to enter back into the market because they're waiting for that buying opportunity. And so even though cash can feel good and, and we should have some on the sideline, you know, making a dramatic shift to cash can be really problematic, more so on a longer term basis versus, you know, in the immediate term. Let's take a look to a little bit, you know, when we think about equities in, in what areas of the market tend to perform well during a high inflationary period. This chart will kind of help shape what areas of the market tend to perform well. But you have to think too, you know, it it can be, you know, more on a longer term basis. These aren't, you know, these rules aren't set in stone. And so we're not looking to, you know, over allocate or overextend into any one sector that maybe does well because, you know, dynamics can shift and, and there's different reasons that can kind of create this inflationary period. Sometimes it's supply, sometimes it's demand. What we've seen so far coming out of COVID is really a little bit of both. We've had a major impact to supply chains, uh, you know, Cost of, of goods have gone up because of that, and production costs in limited uh, supply because of some of the issues internationally. And as we came out of a year, 18 months of really slowing down our spending, we've had this immediate rush in demand. So we've certainly seen some you know, unique factors at play over the last, uh, you know, let's say, year or so since we really started to see inflation on the rise. But we'll focus on the right side of this chart briefly. You know, typically we've seen historically energy do well. And when you think of some of the most dramatic uh, periods of time of high inflation, you know, a lot of it was, you know, part of that was some pretty dramatic energy crisis, right? Back in the 70s, if you think about that, and, and you know, be, it was before my time, but hearing stories was talking to a client actually yesterday about, you know, some of the stories of waiting at the gas pumps and, and the price of oil, uh, you know, the, the, sharp increase that we've seen in the price of oil uh, over the past year. And, you know, that does in turn help a lot of these energy companies. So, you know, we've seen a, a pretty solid uh, track record there in some of these high inflationary periods. But again, you know, there were some factors there that were played that were unique to these periods. Um, you know, consumer staples, that's typically kind of a defensive play that has done well in some of these times. Um, utility, health cares, we've talked about those in the past. Some areas you know, on the left side that haven't done as well, right, during inflationary times, you know, IT or technology companies. In, and we saw that earlier this year with the NASDAQ being sold off a little bit higher than the broad market. But a lot of those growthier technology companies, you know, they're valued for their future growth. And when you think about, you know, rising interest rates due to the Fed because of high inflation, that impacts the current value of a lot of those growthier names in the stock market. We've seen a pretty strong recovery over the last six weeks in particular, but we did weed out some of the uh, you know companies that weren't 
producing as many as strong a cash flow um, in that space. You also see consumer discretionary. And if you think about, you know, again, a high inflationary period, that may pull back on some areas that folks generally spend towards. And so those companies tend to not do as well. Uh, we did receive a question before our presentation, so I'll touch upon it because this graph does bring it up. Uh, but the question was discussing physical gold holdings. You know, is it a good idea during high inflationary times? And if you see sort of in the middle of this chart, you do see precious metals and mining performing well during these times of high inflation over the last 47 years or so. Um, and, and historically, at times they have. You know, I think a big portion of this, though, is when you go back to the 70s. We had, you know, from 73 to 79, we had this six-year period of really high inflation like we're seeing today, you know, high single digits inflation. And gold had a six-year run of 35% annualized returns. And, and I think it kind of has created this notion that gold is the place to be during high inflationary times. Uh, you know, historically speaking, in very long terms, it's done pretty well. And, and one of the drivers to this or the basis behind that argument is, you know, at the end of the day, there is a limited supply of gold. But if we look over the last two years, gold has been relatively flat, some ups and downs. Uh, and, you know, gold has different, you know, it doesn't have the same intrinsic value as uh, a stock may have with cash flows and um, growth rates. And so when you look at gold, I think it's it's good to consider it as a factor within your portfolio, more to the point of low correlation. So if you wanted to hold it, you, you hold it on that basis that it's not really as tightly correlated with stocks or bonds. So it gives you some diversification, no different than some of the alternatives that we held earlier this year, giving us that diversification away from stocks and bonds that were both experiencing significant headwinds due to inflation in a higher interest rate environment. But you know, it's not a situation where you would look to say, I wanna sell out of 30, 40, 50% of my portfolio and put it into gold as this inflation hedge. Because in the short term, it really doesn't have, you know, if inflation spiking, it's not like gold has been spiking during that same time period. So again, I would consider it more as a uncorrelated asset class with a very small, uh, percent of, of an overall allocation, maybe to something like physical gold, but certainly, uh, you know, we're not seeing the same sort of up market in, in gold during this high inflationary time frame. The other thing I'll just touch upon briefly is I bonds, which have become pretty popular as we've seen inflation rise. So I bonds get uh, interest rates get priced twice a year, November and May. Uh, we just recently had the, the May reading. The, the interest rate is nine over 9.6%. In November, it was about 7.2%. Uh, the problem with I-bonds is you're limited to only $10,000 per person per year. So you're not able to put a lot of your portfolio there. Um, you know, the argument could be made to kind of do it incrementally over years. And that could certainly be made. And in, in, it's a strong argument for today when they're yielding over 9%. However, if you look at the eight years prior to sort of this run up in inflation that started last year, uh, you know, the interest rate had been between one and, and two and a half percent, sometimes even zero percent. They were issued uh, earlier this this decade. So, again, it's a time where if you had some short term cash flow needs and you wanted some yield, it could be a great place to park some money. But again, you're limited to it. Uh, and we're unable as advisors to buy into it. You have to buy it directly from Treasury Direct and go through their process. So it's a little unique in terms of having access to it. And like I said, you can only do 10,000 per person per year. So, um, you know, if you don't, if you're questioning why that's not a big part of the portfolio, again, you know, there's no, uh, you know, ETFs or, or ways for us to gain exposure to it on behalf of our clients, unfortunately. So the next segment we'll touch upon briefly in terms of you know, strategies to help you during these high inflationary times is delaying collection of Social Security. And, and we've talked about this in the past, but you know, on average, every year you delay uh, collecting Social Security from 
you know, let's say age 62 to age 70, you get a built-in essentially guaranteed 8% rate of return. And in this type of environment, there's really nowhere else to get that type of return. Uh, now, you know, when it comes to being able to handle that, you know, it really comes down to planning. And, you know, if someone was expecting to take Social Security, maybe at the beginning of this year, maybe they were mid 60s and decided all of a sudden, no, I'm, I'm actually going to delay and, and wait, you know, maybe a year or, or wait the four years till they're uh, age 70. You know, that could make sense. But really, you want to have some planning involved here, because the last thing you want to do is find ways to uh, make up that cash flow difference while selling out of positions that could be down when we saw the volatility uh, increase earlier this year with some, you know, the market being down 20, 25%. So, you know, if, if Social Security is on her, the horizon and you're thinking about taking it early, you know, it's really, really beneficial to do some planning so that, you know, so that we as advisors and planners can look at, okay, how are we going to bridge the gap between maybe retirement and when you're going to be starting to take that social security. But like I said, there's very, very few places where you can get an 8% outside of I-bonds, which is only you know limited to that $10,000 uh, and right now yielding 9.6%. Very little, if not no places to get this 8% guaranteed rate of return each and every year. So it's important if you can if you can bridge that gap from retirement to age 70 and come up with a plan and come up with a plan that makes you feel comfortable bridging that gap, being able to delay till age 70 can, can really pay dividends, not only in the immediate term, like we're seeing this high inflationary environment, but on a longer term basis as well. So if that's something that is approaching for you, certainly let's have those conversations because it's important to uh, you know plan not just two to three months ahead, but really two to three years, maybe even further to really get you set and comfortable with that execution of strategy. And from here, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Harmony Wagner from our team to uh, close us out on some other strategies in a high inflationary environment. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in with us today. I hope that you're finding some valuable information in the presentation so far. I'm going to review a few other strategies or things to think about uh, during periods of high inflation like we find ourselves in now. And, and hopefully some of these are, are applicable and valuable to you. The, the first one I'll review is examining your household budget. So, you know, I'm sure that people who are watching today are watching that the replay later, that you'll have different budgeting habits or, you know, in some cases, a lack thereof. I know when we have client meetings, there can be quite a range of ways that people prefer to handle budgeting in their household. There are some folks who track every single category and could tell you where each and every penny has gone in the month. Others are more free flowing. And, you know, as long as their bank account doesn't start dwindling down to nothing. They're happy um, not knowing. Maybe ignorance is bliss is the approach for those. And, and people fall all the way kind of in the middle of that as well. Um, but during times like this, when paychecks aren't stretching as far as they used to, every dollar really matters, maybe more than it did last month or last year. Um, you know, budgeting, which is always a good financial discipline to have, um, which is probably exactly what you'd expect a financial planner to tell you. Um, but during a, a current environment with, where inflation is high, it can be even more crucial to review monthly spending. Um, and there, there's kind of two objectives that you may achieve um, by having a good handle on your on your monthly spending. And the first is to um, be able to identify what, um, first of all, if you need to cut back expenses, you know, maybe your income is such that even though expenses are higher, you still have a, co a cushion that you're comfortable with, that you're still cash flow positive each month, and you may not feel that you need to make any cuts or, or lifestyle changes at this point. But if you do, um, then budgeting kind of gives you a sense of where you might be able to or where you might need to trim back. Um, so locating whether it's unnecessary ones such as a subscription that maybe you're no longer taking advantage of or that you're okay parting with even just for a short amount of time, um, you know, finding those unnecessary kind of expenses or even avoidable ones. You know, to kind of give a personal example, there was a time a few months back, I noticed that I had a, a bank fee um, because of some re restrictions on my type of checking account. And by just call, quick call to the bank, I was able to, to change the type and, and realize what had changed on their end and have that fixed so that I wouldn't be charged it again in the future. Um, you know, if I hadn't been tracking the budget, I would have never noticed that, probably would have kept paying the bank, you know, month after month, um, but I was able to catch that and, and stop it before it 
got out of hand. So having a good handle on, on what you're spending and, and you know what's going out of your account each month, whether you want to be really disciplined to the penny or just you know kind of knowing on a high level how much you're spending in each category, you know, those things can help you find those unnecessary or even avoidable expenses and fees that um, you can, by reducing those you can really help your, your monthly cash flow situation, especially when other expenses that you can't avoid, like food or gas, are higher now than than they were previously. The second objective of having a good budget is in determining your personal inflation rate. So every month the, the CPI number comes out and it kind of gives a sense of um, what the average American might be experiencing. But in actuality, we all you know, make purchases and our lifestyles are all we all use goods and services in, in different ways. Um, and so, you know, for, for someone who has to spend a lot of gas, maybe you have a long commute, you might realize that maybe your personal inflation rate is actually a little bit higher because gas has been affected more dramatically perhaps than some other areas. Um, so have, helping to, to see what your personal inflation rate is and how your particular lifestyle, things that you buy, the, the, the services that you pay for um, are being affected by inflation. Um, that that can be beneficial as well in terms of your planning. Um, you know, one area of the services industry that's actually experiencing lower than normal inflation right now is healthcare. So healthcare is one kind of sector that typically outpaces the the av average inflation, you know, in a broad scope, um, in, in that it might average five to six percent annually over the long term. Um, but this year, unlike most other categories, it's actually pretty low historically speaking, running around two and two to three percent. Um, so there might be some folks out there who perhaps you were delaying or putting off some non-urgent healthcare procedures or routine tests or anything like that, thinking that with inflation high, the price tag on those kind of um, services would be too steep. Um, it's actually one area that isn't as expensive as some others. If you, one note as well here, if you want to start budgeting or you want to change your current method of, of budgeting, but you aren't sure how, please contact our office. There are some great apps out there that we can recommend. There's free ones. There's ones that have, you know, a small monthly fee, kind of depending on what you're looking for and how in depth you want to get. Um, or if you're a spreadsheet kind of person like, like myself, we have a template we're happy to share as well. So if this is something you want to do, but it might be intimidating, please reach out. We can certainly help with some advice and uh, some resources to share. The next I'll talk about is avoiding um, early payoff of low interest debt. Um, this is actually something that we advise clients about quite often. So it's not just something that's related to inflation being high, but if you do have debt that's low interest, by that I mean you know the interest rate on it is 5% or less, then it's usually beneficial to you know pay your, your monthly payment that's required and, and no more, not paying off the extra principal um, or, or accelerating your principal payments um, and investing the extra cash flow. Because over time, as Ryan mentioned, that the stock market averages about 10% annually. So if you're only paying 5% to, for that debt and you can you can earn 10% annually having it invested, you know, you'd benefit to invest that cash flow instead of paying down the debt. Um, but you know, this webinar today is really about high inflation. So let's talk a little bit about why it might make even more sense during a high inflationary environment to hold off on paying down that debt early. So when inflation is high, every dollar is worth more today than it will be in the future from a real or inflation adjusted perspective. Um, you know, you think about just a dollar store. I remember when I was you know, a kid, you go into the dollar store. If you had one dollar, you could buy you know, any item in that store. I went back in the last one to two years and you know, I realized that it should now be called the dollar and 25 cent store because that's what each item costs now. So you know, years back, a dollar would have bought you anything in that store. Well, you know, now it's only gonna get you 80% of, of the, any item in the store. So in real or inflation adjusted terms, um, you know, your dollar is, is more powerful today than it is in the future. And that impact is only um, you know, exponential when inflation is high. For example, if you have a monthly debt payment, that's $500 today, a fixed debt payment, and inflation is 8% for the year, well, that same monthly payment a year from now is only going to cost you $463 in inflation-adjusted terms, meaning the purchasing power of those dollars goes down, but the fixed um, amount of the debt payment stays the same. So it's actually you know, cheaper from a real perspective or inflation-adjusted perspective to just pay the amount and not paying more, um, whereas you can, you, know, you can wait and you can pay it over the, the fixed schedule that's you know, laid out for the, the debt repayment plan, and in the future, those debt payments will you know cost you less in terms of purchasing power. <laughs> 
The final uh, item I, I want to chat about today, and it doesn't affect everyone, um, but for people who do have a lease currently, um, something you may want to consider is actually buying out that lease at the end of the lease period. Um, so I know some people like to have leases because they like to change their vehicle every couple of years, and, and I can certainly understand that. Um, but for times like this, there's a, there's a reason to at least take pause um, before getting a new lease or you know having that lease just expire and giving it back to the dealership. Um, because of the used car industry right now. So used car prices are 42% above normal levels. So that's very high, even considering how high inflation is, you know, at, at eight to 9% so far for the summer, you know, this is one area of the, of the economy that's impacted in an even more dramatic way. Um, but when you have a leased car, the purchase price that you can buy it out at the end of the lease contract is predetermined. So let's say you got into your lease two or three years ago, the purchase price for that car um, was set at that time and it's part of the contract. So, you know, if, for, for the same vehicle, the same year, model, everything, you know, you may be able to buy it at a much cheaper price now if you had a lease than you would be if you just went on the lot and tried to buy that exact same car, you know, without that predetermined price. So again, it's not something for everyone, but if you do have a lease, then that is something to consider. Look at the price that you might be able to buy that vehicle for, even if you don't love the car and you just want to, you know, buy it out at that fixed price and then turn around and, and sell it, you know, that's an option as well. You might make a nice profit doing so, um, or you could you could buy it out and and just hold on to it for a couple of years until maybe the used car market, you know, settles down to a, a level you're more comfortable with, and you can either get into a new lease or, or buy something different. Uh, but it's something that's worth considering, especially when that price may be, you know, 42% less than what you'd buy that exact same car for just off the lot today. Thank you to, to those who joined us today. Uh, I think we all hope that we've seen the peak of inflation as we saw it come down for July compared to June. But you know, even the July figure at 8.4% is still very high. Um, so as we're all seeing, you know, prices skyrocket and kind of remain at those really elevated levels for a long and uncomfortable, uncomfortably long amount of time, you know, it can leave people feeling helpless. There's not a lot that the average person can do to impact inflation on a macroeconomic scale. Um, so we hope that kind of the strategies we talked about today will help, um, you know, our listeners take some control over how inflation is affecting them, whether it's just having more knowledge and being more aware of the situation and how it's affecting you, or perhaps even being able to take some of these, you know, maneuvers that we talked about, these strategies and turning what's a, a not so great situation in the inflationary environment and turning it into something that could even perhaps benefit you. So we appreciate you spending time with us this afternoon. As always, if you have questions, you want to talk to an advisor about anything we've discussed today or anything else uh, in your financial life, please contact our office anytime. We'd be happy to chat with you and hopefully put you at ease. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your week.